has to be valuable for them, not just when they're sitting at their desks. It has to be valuable for them when they walk out the door. Environmental education is, in my experience as a science teacher, the easiest way to get kids engaged, interested in the subject, and using it outside of the classroom. Very easily. I always am a big proponent of that. And if I could use examples, it might be better. For example, I have energy standards that I must meet. What is energy, sources of energy that we use, etc. And well, environmental education, you can talk about alternative sources of energy and compare them with the more traditional uses of, you know, the fossil fuels and things like that. Um, and you're covering your standards. Um, it also is a very w good way of tying different state standards or national standards together. You learn chemistry, you learn the molecules, you learn the atoms. When you get to the, the standards that cover ecosystems, you can reiterate the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the hydrogen, hydro water cycle, and how those standards tie together. So it's a theme that can cover your entire curriculum and tie it all together. Yes, um, the last, when we really hit environmental education in my classroom, which was the, in my classroom and in my school, which was 2007-2008, our state test scores on environmental science went up. So I know there's hard evidence there that it happens. It's that real life connection, which I referred to earlier, is very important to incorporate. When you incorporate environmental themes into your lesson, you're giving them something to do on a daily basis, turn off lights, check your water. Uh, you're making them smarter consumers. They're looking at products a little more closely. They're, they're looking at what they put into their mouths, the foods they eat a little more closely. So there's a great impact there. I've also, I think another very important impact is you show them that there's other careers available to them, not just doctor and lawyer, which most kids, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer when they walk into my classroom. Um, I, I asked them the first day of school to draw me a scientist. And they draw me, invariably, 18 years I've been doing this, 6th graders through 12th graders. They draw me a crazy old man with crazy hair and a lab coat with chemicals in front of them on a table blowing stuff up. That is the image that they have of science and science careers. The last day of school I asked them to draw me a scientist again. And every year, I have great satisfaction when I see they draw themselves in the picture. First of all, if they're women, they draw, if they're girls, they draw girls. If they're African American, they draw an African American. If they, they're not drawing that old, crazy Einstein looking guy. And he is wonderful, Albert Einstein, but I need kids to relate to, see themselves as scientists. They draw themselves climbing volcanoes, they draw themselves studying barracudas underwater. They draw themselves designing better materials for skateboards. They draw themselves in, uh, as food chemists making new candy, uh, safety features on cars, and that's hopefully my impact, that they can see themselves as scientists. And opens, it opens a door to a whole variety of careers I never thought about before. You cannot do this without a supportive principal. I suppose you can do a lot of the lessons without a principal's support, but when you try to make it a school-wide project, when you try to get other teachers involved, when you ask the math teacher to do an environmental lesson, or the art teacher, or the PE teacher, which I have done, you need the principal's support. When the kids, they, when you start teaching them this, they're going to want to start a recycling program. They're going to want to start saving water. They're going to talk about solar panels on the roof. They're going to do that. And so you need your principal behind you saying, do what you have to do. I believe in you. Go for it. Um, parents are a valuable resource. Never close the door to parents. You're going to find some scientists among those parents. You're going to find somebody who has access to materials that you can use in your labs. You're going to find perhaps some volunteers that can come in and help you. There's a whole host of stuff that parents can help you with. So. You, that's a wonderful thing to have. Open the door to parents and ask them to volunteer and see what kind of resources, resources they could share with you. The first partnership is with the teachers across the hall who teach the same subject that I do. We work together. And that's wonderful because I have my strengths and I have my weaknesses. And they might help me with areas of science to strengthen my program. That's first off. Secondly, I found it very important to reach out to the middle, to the high school 
teachers that f my kids will eventually have and to the elementary school teachers that they already had. Um, my kids are coming better prepared in measuring, for example, metric measuring, graphing skills. They're coming better prepared in a lot of ways because I've talked to the elementary school teachers. And then there's your local universities. I have so many contacts at two major universities where I live and I have those parents, the, the, sorry, those professors who are sometimes parents come in and speak to my children. If I have a child who wants to work on a science fair project that is, that needs mentoring, that needs a lab, that needs the type of equipment that I just cannot provide, I make sure I find a lab, a college professor who's willing to help those students. And, and they are out there and they're willing, they really want to help. So that community partnership is very important. We also have a great partnership with a construction company, which is how we got the roof painted white uh, for free with all the materials and labor donated. Um, it's great to form partnerships with uh, reporters in the local newspapers, which I have. So whenever I'm going to do something really great, I make sure I call her and she tends to show up and take photographs and write an article for the local you know, section of the paper. So that's a good partnership to have as well. The main challenge is covering the test, the state exam requirements, and still being able to be creative and have time for these types of projects that take a little more time. The second challenge is convincing colleagues that this is good stuff, this is a good idea. Um, I overcame that challenge in my school by if some people just didn't want to do environmental lessons, they just I ask them, all you have to do is turn off the lights and shut down the computers at the end of the day. If you don't want to create lessons that integrate with environmental education, that's fine. I didn't push it. So those are two big challenges to deal with. Another challenge would be the students who are absent a lot, whose parents are not available. Um, but in a way, you're going to have that challenge anyway. And environmental education might light a spark in that child that otherwise would not be lit. So when you have that child going home and thinking about turning off lights and getting their parents more involved, it's actually the challenge becomes less challenging. Mm -hmm. Try it. Go to these wonderful websites that, uh, with all of the links to the different lessons. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, find just try it and you're going to see that was what, what was once a lesson on energy and what is energy and the ability to do work suddenly becomes a debate in your classroom about the benefits of solar energy or the problems with fossil fuel energies and, and you're going to see that the kids are more engaged. So I just say give it a try and see how it works at any level of your curriculum.